Hello, everybody. Welcome to us. <laughs> I'm going to do it again. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. This is Tetsu from Ask Tetsu. Hello, everyone. I'm Ute Lima Haribold from Ute's International Lounge. And hello, my name is Rita Rosenbach. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It is 2 a.m. for me, okay? Yes, That's my yeah. You're... I can only do this while I'm in Japan. <laughs> You are excused. Uh, today we are having another fantastic e episode and welcome. I want to say a warm welcome to our guest, Yezim Zevinc uh, from the Multiling Center in at the University of Oslo. Today let's talk about heritage language anxiety. Please, uh, Yejim, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and about the centre you're working, working uh, at at the moment. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so very much uh, for the invite. Uh, well, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre for Multilingualism for, um, for Multilingualism in Society across the lifespan at the University of Oslo. And uh, this is a center, interdisciplinary center that uh, combines different methods and, and theories on multilingual, um, uh, multilingualism uh, in different social contexts. And uh, about me, well, I am kind of, my ac academic background is in the field of interdisciplinary linguistics, and it concerns uh, social, emotional, uh, pedagogical and physiological aspects of multilingualism with a specific focus on emotions in minority or immigrant contexts. So that's more or less about me. That, that's such a fantastic uh, focus you have and, and so important. And what I've found when I research this a little bit, there, is, there isn't that much research into these aspects and, and especially with the focus that you have got. So how, uh, what led you to choose this as your focus? Oh, well, this is a great question. Um, I wasn't doing this, you know, I was just uh, collecting data from bilinguals, putting them in a monolingual mode in at a lab and uh, just checking their language use and uh, language knowledge in different languages. Then I just came across a third generation Turkish Dutch bilingual during the experiment who was like uh, shaking during the experiment, you know, and I was like, okay, just relax, w what's going on? And we started to talk, discuss, and he gave me this idea, but, you know, studying heritage language anxiety outside the classroom as well. So um, as I started to pay attention to bilinguals and their emotions, I really found out that it's a very common uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. in immigrant context. So that's how it started. How oh, fascinating. So, so can you, can you explain to us what, what does it exactly mean? As such, you can think that that sounds like a very a negative, negative term, but uh, it is important. So can you please explain to us of what uh, you mean? I can start explaining um, language anxiety in general first, perhaps for our audience who uh, do not know language anxiety, you know. Uh, it's commonly defined as the feeling of apprehension, fear or worry that someone experiences when learning or using or communicating in a foreign or a second language. Mm -hmm. And it can be linked to different uh, linguistic skills. I mean, it doesn't have to be um, only speaking anxiety. It can also be linked to writing, listening or reading apprehension. And the topic of this language anxiety has so far been widely examined in the field of second language acquisition, but mostly in classroom settings, right? In the context of formal second language or foreign language learning. Mm -hmm. And today, in line with my research area, um, we'll discuss heritage language anxiety that also occurs in some bilinguals' everyday lives outside mm -hmm. the classroom setting including during their interactions with family members, uh, friends, or with or around people who are considered to be native or monolingual speakers of that heritage language. For instance, uh, during bilinguals' visits to their home country okay. or country of origin. But 
I'll illustrate these social settings later, but first of all, I'd like to clarify that. I'll be answering all these questions and your questions within the scope of the research projects that I've been conducting on yeah. language anxiety in the immigrant context for the last seven years, you know. And in one of these projects, which was my PhD project at the Multilink Center again, I drew on three different data sources, questionnaires, interviews, and physiological measurements, okay. such as heart rate, skin conductance levels, you know, measured during uh, different language modes. And uh, those data sources uh, were collected from three generations of Turkish immigrants living in the Netherlands. And currently, in another project, I'm investigating emotions, including both negative and positive emotions, negative emotions such as, again, anxiety, but also shame, guilt, and regret and positive ones are like pride, joy, and gratitude. We'll, I'll be talking about uh, those positive emotions as well at some point. And this time, I'm looking at different immigrant groups, not only Turkish immigrants, but also Pakistani, uh, Polish immigrant communities living in Norway. So within the scope of these projects, I would define heritage language anxiety as the feeling of apprehension, concern, fear or worry experienced by mostly young generations of immigrant or minority communities when they speak or use the language they learned in the family, which is at the same time, um, you know, the language that holds the minority status in their residential country. So mm -hmm. heritage language here can also be referred as home language or minority language or mother language or whatever you or bilingual speakers themselves call it. Bilinguals who participated in my projects, uh, mostly with Turkish immigrant background, they often prefer the term heritage language because they consider this language they learned in the family as their heritage to keep maintain or protect and pass on to the next generation and that also made them anxious about it you know mm. so they didn't choose to use the term home language for turkish as they also use the majority language dutch in the netherlands or norwegian in norway in their home that's the reason why i also prefer the term heritage language anxiety over home language anxiety yeah yeah yes that 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 absolutely makes makes sense. So, so why does this um, speci with a specific, specifically the heritage language um, anxiety happen, and and what are the effects of it? Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps I can tell first, like who can be affected by it. You know, mostly because it's important to point out that, like. Uh, there is not one particular immigrant community or there is not only one specific type of person who experiences, you know, like that heritage language anxiety. We all know that multilingualism is not always a garden of roses for everyone. Although it's a gift and privilege for some, it's still a burden for many families. So not only heritage language anxiety, but also other negative emotions such as shame, you know, fear, worry, guilt, regret about deviation from social, cultural, religious, or standard language norms are still common in many multilingual families, particularly in uh, underprivileged families who also suffer from daily stressors, you know, uh, challenges such as inequalities, racism, uh, socioeconomic, mm -hmm. sociocultural, or sociolinguistic challenges. So, Anxiety about the heritage language can be crucial and unavoidable part of daily life communication for the, those underprivileged multilingual families. Uh, that being said, any bilingual who is exposed mm -hmm. to such negative social or um, cultural experiences or linguistic tension and anyone who feels insecure and constantly worries about their heritage language competence and skills in specific situations or with uh, certain people can be affected by heritage language anxiety. Uh, when it comes to the question of why it happens, 
uh, well, in a collaborative study with Professor Abbakis, we reported the results from interviews on the causes and effects of heritage language anxiety. And we discovered two main categories for its causes, language related causes and socio-emotional causes. Yet, although we discussed these two categories separately, we also noted that most of the time it was impossible to distinguish socio-emotional factors from language related factors, you know, because they were very often uh, intertwined. Um, to illustrate, uh, when participants said that they felt anxious because of their own insufficient heritage language competence, they immediately added a socially related factor to it. You know, I feel that way because also because of the fear or shame or pressure and negative experiences I had in my family or in school you know, or during my visit to Turkey in so-called home country. So mm -hmm. it turns out that when bilinguals worry about their heritage language skills and language use, such as uh, unconventional grammar, you know, pronunciation, or code mixing or incorrect vocabulary use, the real source of their anxiety, heritage language anxiety, may not be only the language or language competence itself, but also mm -hmm. other issues such as pressure, you know, social evaluation, stereotyping, the feeling of being evaluated, judged, mm -hmm. discriminated, or uh, seen as different or seen as um, the other. And it is very important here in that sense, heritage language anxiety can be considered as a psychological response to evaluation, right? Mm -hmm. And this uh, concept of evaluation can be social related or self related evaluation or language, culture or identity related evaluation. So here it's crucial to take into account the fact that although heritage language anxiety is overall considered as a psychological response, well, it's also constantly related to other multifaceted factors such as social exclusion, feeling of belonging, insecurities about linguistic abilities, um, as well as like worries about the natural phenomena of bilingual speech, you know, code mixing around other people. Uh, code switching around other people from the mainstream community, as well as other factors such as power relations, inequalities arising from the feeling of being different and, mm -hmm. um, you know, because of the current uh, negative experiences. And of course, it also includes physiological responses that are linked to our autonomic nervous system. Yeah such as increased heart rate and skin conductance levels. Yeah, so um, I would have a, a question because you mentioned just now that, uh, for example, when these heritage speakers, maybe of second, third generation, are visiting their country of origin, that they can experience some kind of anxiety, but it can also happen in the country where they are growing up, so the country abroad. So we have two different situations where this heritage language anxiety happens. Um, yes. Is there a, a difference or a noticeable difference? I mean, I think from from the, the context, of course, and the expectations that might not be met. Uh, absolutely. Well, it mostly occurs uh, during their visits to Turkey, uh, of course, um, because, um, you know, uh, one Turkish immigrant mother, for example, no, um, let's say, I'll put this that way, like when they feel anxious in Turkey, it's more related to their identity, right? Mm -hmm. um, to illustrate this, one 15-year-old uh, Turkish Dutch bilingual, I, I interviewed him, and he addressed that his anxiety when speaking Turkish in Turkey was closely related to negative attitudes of Turks living in Turkey, you know, towards Turkish immigrants living mm -hmm. in Europe. So yes. some people constantly evaluate and judge immigrant bilinguals' ethnic 
Turkish identity and commitments. And another important point here, like these negative experiences occurs in Turkey and that affects them uh, more than in the Netherlands because they feel more like Turkish and they want to feel belonging to their families, relatives there. They want to play with their cousins, for example. But there is this idea, there is this label in Turkey called like Almanju. They are labeled as Almanju, you know, an immigrant Turk living in any West European country is labeled as Almanju, meaning German like, regardless of the country they migrated to. So this label, um, Almanju label, has several negative connotations. Uh, but the main point here is that the fear of such uh, labels, fear of being negatively evaluated, stereotyped, mocked, excluded, or seen as foreigner in the country of origin surely triggers heritage language anxiety. And uh, especially when immigrants speak their heritage languages during their visits to their home country. And that 15 year old bilingual child, you know, he said, he kept saying, referring to his cousins in Turkey as normal Turk, you know, because uh, his relatives in Turkey always judge him saying, what kind of Turk are you, you know, you don't know the language. And he, he wants to show, he wants to prove that he's Turkish, he's real Turkish. So he kept referring to his cousins during the interview, his cousins there in Turkey as normal Turk. So it was like he also started to consider himself abnormal, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said when he unconsciously speaks Dutch with his cousins there in Turkey, you know, they laugh and say like, you Dutch guy, what are you saying, you know? So he feels uh, constantly uh, embarrassed for not being seen as Turkish. So such emotional factors related to bilingual sense of self, identity and sense of belonging as well as fear of exclusion causes heritage language anxiety. There are also uh, several factors within the family, you know, factors such as language pressure, uh, panic related to societal or cultural norms, mm -hmm. parenting style or intergenerational conflict. These all cause heritage language anxiety. Um, Considering that in some cultures, you know, deviation from the heritage language anxiety is often taken as deviation from the heritage culture or heritage identity. So uh, immigrant children, uh, they start to feel anxious about making errors, not to deviate from standard or native like heritage language norms, you know. These are some of the reasons why they feel more anxious during their visits to Turkey. But they also feel anxious within the family when they use their heritage languages with their uh, father or grandparents. I was shocked, you know, when I found this result. So uh, the reason is mostly because bullying, you know, mocking, even if it's a joke, uh, these things still, uh, you know, affect identity they are related to sense of self you know like they are they are really like uh, affecting more than other experiences that's why uh, they feel more anxious and yes. the family yeah and um yeah and um i i know that in your in your work you also distinguish between anxiety and insecurity and now listening to you i was constantly drawn is this now insecurity or is this anxiety insecurity is one of the reasons of anxiety anxiety is more like um emotion uh that is uh related to uh well physiology cognitive skills and all kinds of linguistic and social experiences and linguistic insecurity like feeling um uh, not sufficient in one language is one of the reasons of heritage language anxiety. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, yes, um, what I, I think when, when you speak about this, what I think about is, is there seems to be um, like the viewpoint is that 
I do not know something instead of being proud of what you know. And that is because there are expectations and unmet expectations which, which lead to disappointment, uh, like you, you mentioned grandparents. So it, it feels like there is so much need for information and, and um, kind of education of families too, that children do learn better when they get the support and uh, to be to, to show uh, happiness for what they can do instead of uh, making them nervous about what they can't but we will come back to that yet later but that just came very strongly to me so yeah there are strong judgments within the family as well even though it's a joke you know like they they keep mocking <laughs> Uh, bullying uh, those kids uh, regarding like there is a difference between humor good humor and bullying or mocking about insecurities so of course this this is uh, causing heritage language anxiety instead and the, it is also kind of if a child hears over and over and over again you can't speak this or you don't know that you don't know turkish you don't know no urdu you you don't know this or that that's that kind of that's uh, it's like a, a a child will start to believe i don't know this i can't i can't I, there's no point me trying because i i can't anyway so so yeah, this, uh, absolutely. Uh, this is linked to uh, fixed um, monolingual mindsets. You know, they create these aggressive monolingualism in the family or in schools. You know, there are still um, punishments when when uh, bilingual children use their heritage languages in some classrooms, and there is always a pressure in which those bilingual uh, children are exposed to both in school and in family. And they have to, you know, acquire the majority language as well at an optimal level. Uh, but mostly, you know, um, when it comes to family level, it's more like uh, one of the, well, uh, parents said it, for example, uh, mother said it like it's not related to uh, uh, language, you know, it's definitely related to our uh, parenting style. You know, mm -hmm. we raised our kids with insecurities, with fear. You know, mm -hmm. um, so she was pretty uh, regretful later mm -hmm. about how they raised their children, and they abandoned their heritage language. So that turned out a more negative experience and caused further. Uh, negative emotions in the family. So I was going to put in some comments uh, on my own experience growing up, but I, I, I see that we've got a few comments already in uh, from our audience, and I'd like to, to put some up that, that sort of reflects what I uh, was thinking. Well, first of all, we, ha we have Heather saying a very nice thing. This talk is so fascinating. That's exactly really echoes what I've been uh, feeling right this whole time listening to you talk. And we also have Anika saying, never thought of this, but it makes a lot of sense to keep in mind. And uh, for me, this, is, this whole talk about uh, this Turkish immigrant family and the relationship within the family, or when they go back to the country, uh, all this uh, sort of brought back memories of when I was growing up in Taiwan uh, and I was going back and forth between Taiwan and Japan and I'd get people you know, asking me to say this or that in Japanese or, you know, and then when I went to Canada and now all these different countries that sort of come into the mix where I, I started feeling like I sort of belong everywhere, but I don't belong anywhere. It's kind of like mm -hmm. that, that glass full, uh, glass half full, glass uh, half empty sort of thing. But uh, of course I try to keep uh, this positive twist on everything and I've been able to come out uh, well, well, I think, <laughs> but I, I can totally, I can totally yeah. see how various families could get sort of stuck in that, and children can really feel, yeah. feel stuck in that in that situation. So, and absolutely, as, as we are older, we can have a more mature view mm -hmm. on it. But we, with the young, uh, evolving person, that uh, it's a lot harder to to deal with and to kind of establish you, you as, yourself as an identity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In many in many contexts, like uh, parents or grandparents 
transmit their own fears and anxieties about losing their heritage mm -hmm. language and culture to their children and grandchildren, you know? When bilingual children take on these fears and concerns as their own, they feel anxious about making errors and not to deviate from the standard native-like heritage language norms. So yes. in that sense, heritage language anxiety can be very contagious, especially uh, through social peer learning in which children observe and acquire and take on the anxious behaviors of their parents or grandparents with respect to their heritage language, culture, or identity. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually now you're answering the question from Trish, uh, who asked, uh, how can heritage language anxiety be prevented or minimized? So it's, it's if the environment, if I understand, is actually supportive and um, fosters pride in, in the language. Or would you like um, to add? Uh, if you don't mind, uh, Ute, should we take that question last? Um, that was... Uh, to, because first, I would like to see what coping strategies there, there are before we go into prevention. <laughs> okay, yeah, if you are in, because we have talked all, uh, at length now about how it, uh, how it uh, kind of affects families. And then how, if you are in that situation, how can you cope? Yes, true. But I haven't mentioned all the effects, you know, uh, oh. so it's very important to really yes. like mention those effects before we uh, continue with the coping strategies. Um, well, some of the effects, well, let me put this that way. First, ample evidence from educational and social psychology indicates that what goes on in our minds, you know, in the minds of individuals can either facilitate or inhibit language learning processes, uh, such as language anxiety, which is processed both in the mind and body and triggered by social environment and surrounding. And uh, as reported in the field of second language acquisition, uh, language anxiety affects multilingual development mostly in a debilitating way by influencing bilinguals' ability to use or maintain a language as well as their mental or physiological well-being. To illustrate this, um, this debilitating effect of heritage language anxiety, many bilinguals who participated in my studies reported that when heritage language anxiety occurs, especially in Turkey, you know, they experience further speech errors. They are not able to find words or they even forget the words they know, you know, they, they, they are good at the language, but when this hits them hard, they even forget everything they know and they just uh, stop using the language. That's the most important effect of it, you know. In order to avoid heritage language anxiety, bilinguals often avoid using the heritage language and eventually they abandon it. And due to this avoidance in heritage language anxiety, bilingual families give up on using their home languages. Second generation uh, Turkish immigrants, for example, they were like, we're not gonna make the same mistake as our parents made, uh, putting us into pressure. So we'll just abandon the heritage mm -hmm. language, but this caused further problems, socio-emotional problems and further uh, generational conflict in the family, which also caused the vicious circle link, you know, uh, between language anxiety, language use, and language competence. So due to anxiety, bilingual children ultimately avoid uh, using the heritage language, which causes less language use and therefore reduced proficiency in the heritage language. And again, in return, you know, further heritage language anxiety. So it's very important to break this vicious circle uh, link by keep using the heritage language um in everyday life you know no matter how you use it it doesn't have to be perfect just try to use it a as much as you can and motivate your children to use it as well so um let me um, recap both causes and effects before we, we move on to coping strategies um, heritage language anxiety relates to a 
psychological, behavioral, or physiological state that is closely linked to the social environment and linguistic and socio-emotional factors that bilinguals are exposed to, right? So it can affect family well-being and family relations, bilingual social interactions and self-image identities, you know, as well as their multilingual language use practices and competence, especially when unwillingness to communicate in the heritage language and avoidance is involved. So perhaps I can start with coping strategies. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, uh, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's, um, it's so important. It's, it's quite heavy to think about uh, this as because there is negativity in it, but it's important. If we don't talk about it, we can't find any solution to it. And it's important that parents are aware of it. We can see from the comments that all the, all the comments, well, I've never really thought about that. And that's why it's important to be aware of it. So, so what are the possible coping strategies? I'm, I'm uh, sorry, Trish and Ute, I interrupted that question earlier because I, I, I wanted to us, us to, to speak about all the different kind of effects and causes. But yeah, coping strategies. Coping strategies. Well, I am going to start with the negative one again. I'm sorry, Rita. <laughs> but the most common strategy adopted by my participants you know, was unfortunately avoidance. Uh, the closest exit from the heritage language maintenance, you know. Uh, second generation parents stopped using the heritage language at home to cope with heritage language anxiety, which caused further problems, as I mentioned earlier. However, it's not all doom and gloom for multilingual families. There are also families who could adopt positive coping strategies when maintaining the heritage language as Professor Anik de Hauer's studies on harmonious bilingualism show, right? Um, also drawing on recent empirical evidence from uh, psychology of language learning and positive psychology, the work by, uh, by uh, Professor Peter McIntyre, Sarah Mercer, Tammy Gregerson and Jean-Marc Duell, it's safe to confirm that the more bilinguals enjoy learning a language, the better they master it. Additionally, enjoyment as a positive emotion, you know, has been found to build resilience, emotional resilience, which decreases uh, the level of language anxiety. So positive emotions such as pride, joy and gratitude, as well as positive emotional connections with the heritage language, which is very important, you know, with the heritage language and culture can build required emotional resilience to heritage language anxiety. That being said, a warning here, you know, when referring to positive emotions as a coping strategy, we should really pay attention to the emotion of pride. Uh, although it's a positive emotion, the fine line between language pride and language or moral panic should be considered. Well, language pride may sometimes be reflected through uh, pressure about extreme nationalism or language or moral panic in some bilingual families. This may lead to socio-emotional limbo or conflict rather than motivation for bilingual children. You know, Undoubtedly, uh, we should, or bilinguals should be proud of their heritage language and culture, but without downgrading or building negative attitudes towards other languages or cultures, you know, multilingual identities of children should be embraced and supported both in family and in school and outside in society in order to cope with heritage language anxiety. So, for instance, uh, families should understand that their children do not become less Turkish when they speak Dutch better than Turkish, you know, and it's the pressure or negative experiences that affect bilinguals, multilingual identity construction. They are language practices and decisions in future, you know, as in the case of some second generation uh, Turkish Dutch bilinguals who abandoned their heritage languages due to the conflict between multiculturalism, language pride or moral panic, you know. So I can give one positive example. <laughs> Well, one of the parents I have recently interviewed, a Turkish immigrant mother 
who married a Norwegian, uh, the couple uh, actually has two daughters at the age of 14 and 16 again, who speak Turkish very well, as well as four other languages, you know, and the parents taught all these languages through their resilience, patience, perseverance, and emotional connections with the language and culture and through enjoyment. The mother considered Turkish as the most valuable inheritance that she would leave to her daughters while she also taught them that all languages were equally important. She managed to find activities that her children enjoy doing uh, in the heritage culture or in the heritage language like cooking, you know, in order to uh, uh, play with them or, you know, just singing lullabies in the heritage language. Uh, in order to motivate them to use and maintain Turkish and to reduce their language anxiety. Her evaluation of her daughter's language skills was also different from other parents. Unlike other parents, she didn't base her multilingual parenting on a perfect monolingual norm, you know, mm -hmm. or monolingual ideologies, um, or on a pressure that might hamper children's self-confidence. She believed that her children didn't have to speak Turkish perfectly. And it was already great that they kept speaking it, you know, they didn't abandon it. So to recap, parents should try to identify and cultivate positive states, like improvements, progresses, and qualities in child's multilingual development. And this style of parenting can add a positive filter to the way a child reacts to negative emotions, such as heritage, language, anxiety, and other negative experiences, while it also limits the likelihood of children using avoidance or aggressive coping responses. Well, in short, building resilience through positive emotions and respect for diversity respect for other cultures and languages can be the ideal way to cope with heritage language anxiety. Yes, absolutely. That's that's great. So many good ideas. And I, what I was thinking also, I think parents have a really important uh, role here. Um, thinking, for example, let's say a family where, where maybe the first generation is still back in, in the in the back home in, in the country and then the, the parents migrated and their children are now in this situation that you describe. Uh, I think it would be also good for parents to explain to those back home, so to say, the situation um, the children are in, because I think, uh, or what I've, I've experienced that myself, I've, I've seen that they don't really understand what it means to be surrounded kind of 95 or 90 percent of the time in a different language and what happens to your own language and they don't say they only see it kind of from the very narrow point of view of oh yes you you knew um turkish or whichever language so well when you left and now you come back and then your children don't speak it so so it's a i know it's difficult to to kind of try to educate one's parents, <laughs> but but there is still kind of, um, what would you recommend? In, what, how could uh, my parents address their parents or their children's grandparents to explain, explain that please don't set these high expectations because like I mentioned before, the problem comes when the expectations are not met. So they should lower their expectations, instead be happy when, when the child says something, at least something in Turkish. Yeah, um, there were families who managed that, you know, and it's all about communication and sharing their own emotions and, you know, uh, kind of educating themselves first about bilingualism and multilingualism. Of course, they don't have any idea in Turkey how it is to grow up with two languages or two cultures. So they keep evaluating and judging their um, multilingual background. Uh, in order to fight this, well, parents should be proud of their own uh, children, you know, and they should talk to uh, they are relatives first, like you said, uh, one of the parents, for example, 
she was like, I'm, I'm not going to come to visit you again, you know, if you mm -hmm. keep doing this. Mm -hmm. um, please just don't do or say such things like, hey, you Dutch guy, what are you saying? You know, hey, mm -hmm. your Turkish is horrible, blah, blah, blah. Even though uh, children, you know, uh, are invited to play in the neighborhood, you know, other children behave very nice, you know, invite them to play. Uh, after that, they like children stop playing with them. So they really lost the only chance to kind of um, practice their languages in Turkey. So one of the parents was really frustrated about that. Uh, they really have to be strict about their communication in the family back there in the country, you know. Just warn your parents, like, this doesn't work like this. And whatever comes from their mouth, you know, it should be uh, appreciated, like you said, yeah. you know, yeah. through positive emotions. Yeah, and, and it's not only the adults, it's also the children. I remember when I visited Germany and I, I once a year and I, I played with my cousins who were my, my age group, uh, they had their slang, they had their ways to play and do things and it felt like immersing into another world. Although I was fluent in German, but I was talking uh, Auslandsdeutsch, yeah, <laughs> German uh, that everyone learns when growing up abroad. So I was not uh, on top of uh, yeah the the slang, the local slang, and also the the teenage slang that they were using then at some point. So I think it's also a bit uh, building the resilience in the children to know how to respond to peers because uh, in my experience the worst things happened uh, among peers not with adults although yeah, yeah. Uh, children can be really cruel about these <laughs> judgments and evaluations so yeah. we need to watch out this comes to the question of how to recognize heritage language anxiety you know mm -hmm. um well many parents who participated in my study um, they didn't even know their uh, children uh, had that anxiety, you know. Uh, they believe that their children wouldn't have any anxiety because for them, their children are too young for anxiety. But they are mm -hmm. wrong, you know. Um, so this anxiety also created by peers and, and like friends in the home country or in the mainstream society as well. So, so what what can parents do do then? How how can they recognize this in their own children? So, what are the signs to look out, look out for? Are there any red flags? So, where, where if you see this, then you have to kind of stop and take count and uh, consider what's happening and yeah, and what to do then. Uh, well, it's important to recognize and understand heritage language anxiety. So, uh, first. Um, uh, to achieve this, parents uh, can or should observe their children's behaviors, of course. When their children interact with people, with relatives, with friends, and when they speak the heritage language. If they avoid using uh, the language or if they avoid playing with or socializing with their friends or cousins or relatives back there in their home country, if they behave less willing, le willing to communicate, more ill-tempered, many parents uh, suggested that, 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 you know, like their uh, kids behave really ill-tempered during their visits, so nervous, you know, like all these breakdowns and everything. So um, they should watch out, like what kind of specific situations their uh, children are more nervous, you know, more than other times. Hesitance or avoidance, you know, in social situations, especially when children are asked to interact with people who communicate in the heritage language can be the sign of heritage language anxiety. Second, um, of course, to recognize heritage language anxiety, parents uh, should certainly communicate their own emotions with their children, right? Mm -hmm. Also, they should encourage their children to do so simply by asking like, 
how they feel, how they're doing, if they're enjoying playing with their cousins or if they're enjoying their stay at their relatives in the home country and so on and so forth. It's not just like leaving your kid in a street on the street and with a bunch of kids over there and watch them bullied or even not see them bullied or something like that, you know. Um, so after recognizing heritage language anxiety, this is also important, like what can they do to help, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we talk about anxiety as a negative uh, point, but it's not. I mean, it's a natural phenomenon, right? Uh, it's natural reaction of our body, which tells us like, hey, we are, you are alive, your heart beats, you know, uh, this is just normal. And this means like this also means like they really care about it. So mm -hmm. this this is not always a negative uh, association, you know. Um, that's why parents should first of all watch their own language and attitudes toward their children's anxieties. You know, mm -hmm. shielding children from anxiety is not a solution. They should rather realize and teach children that language anxiety is a natural reaction of the body. And to maintain this attitude, parents uh, should increase their own awareness about heritage language anxiety first, rather than judging their children for their anxieties, they must absolutely reassure them, you know, responding to heritage language anxiety through ignorance, denial or overreaction or further negative emotions such as blame, fear or worry does not uh, help for sure. And family attitudes towards heritage language anxiety and children insecurities, you know, matter a lot given that insulting, you know, bullying or mocking children's insecurities all the time induce further language anxiety, while it also hampers self-esteem, children's self-esteem and coping skills in anxiety triggering situations. Yeah. Um, I, I would like to add something because it made me think about uh, um, when we traveled through Germany with my parents and you have different regions and you have different German uh, regional uh, dialects or regional variants. And I remember that when we arrived in Bavaria, my, my parents come from Hessen and they said, OK, when now you go and ask for a glass of water, you have to say it this way. So they prepared us that actually what we were hearing and the way that you relate yourself to each other, to someone else, an, uh, an adult person in that case, uh, was slightly different from what I was used at my grandparents' uh, town. So I think it's also a little bit preparing the children of the the huge variety of different ways of, of saying things, of being to, uh, talked to, that helped me personally very much because then I, I took it like a game. Can I understand now this uh, regional uh, variant of German or not? And so it became more a game than, than a challenge. I think that was quite absolutely yeah, yeah we should remember that emotion language and culture they are all intertwined you know and it's crucial to establish positive emotional and cultural ties with the heritage language and practicing language through joyful pleasant emotional and cultural experiences by using both the heritage language and culture for instance to as i said uh, sing songs, you know, uh, lullabies, read stories, playing games, you know, such fun activities can build a huge emotional impact that motivates children in the right way to use the heritage language and cope with heritage language anxiety. Um, fear uh, just uh, it also show it's also shown in psychology of language learning studies, you know. Uh, using negative emotions to motivate uh, students or children is not the ideal way to cope with negative emotions. Mm -hmm. And as a positive emotion, when we talk about positive emotions, you know, gratitude uh, works so well as a positive way of practicing the heritage language. Before bed, you know, ask your children to list three things that has 
happened that day so they can remember good things in the heritage language and anything new that they learned in the heritage language about or about the culture you know ask them to list new words or any new knowledge they have learned that day teach them how to be grateful and happy for their multilingual skills and um, turn these activities into a habitual practice uh, one of the parents did this, uh, one of the mothers did this, and the uh, child actually got so used to it. Uh, every night before the bedtime, you know, are we doing our ritual time, mama? You know, mm -hmm. we, we forgot to do Wonderful. it today, you know? So all these experiences, positive experiences, motivate us more, you know? Uh, so it's very important to rewire all these negative emotions and negative mm -hmm. experiences through positive ones. So it, it does help uh, according to recent research in psychology of language learning. And I think it, I think that's that's such an important thing, and and what you said, Uti, as well, that your your parents prepared you by telling that there are different ways of think, of, of speaking, and even the same language. And I think to to speak to a child about being multilingual and what what a precious gift that is that you can express yourself uh, in in different languages, and and. It, and also kind of prepare a child for those situations where we can't, because like you said, we can't and shouldn't shield our children for, for negative ex experience. They will have to live through them. But especially in, in peer to peer situations, we can't be there, but to prepare them to kind of, if someone says, well, you don't, you didn't, you say that it sounds strange when you use that word or whatever so if they move their accent or, or missing a word so that they have the knowledge kind of even if they don't necessarily have to say it out loud there and then but they have the knowledge yes but I know that thing in two languages <laughs> you know to, to have that inner confidence mm -hmm. totally agree um, yeah and you know, uh, to probably, uh, well, when we talk about coping or um, preventing heritage language, well, preventing, well, that, that's a tough one. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. we, we shouldn't use like preventing uh, because as you said, it's inevitable in some certain context. So uh, whatever uh, families, bilinguals do, you know, whatever multilingual families do, their children may still experience it in some okay. social context. So you're right. So I'll, that... I'll rephrase my question and use <laughs> how can parents prepare their children for for this situation? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, the, the best way, of course, it's not always uh, the parents' fault, right? Or if it's not always parents. Uh, responsibility you know the best way to prevent or cope with heritage language anxiety well first of all it requires a change at societal level you know uh, we need to build a society that embrace social justice and multilingualism as a norm regardless of sociolinguistic hierarchies of languages different languages varieties or um, social or uh, racial categories uh, those monolingual mindsets, aggressive monolingualism, you know, monolingualism as a norm, you know, negative attitudes of individuals towards diversity and language variation uh, should or can change through multilingual education and larger policies in society. And until that change occurs, mm -hmm. uh, we should first understand and through treat heritage language anxiety as a natural phenomenon, as I said before, and should not look at it something to prevent or like a taboo, you know, but something mm -hmm. to cope with and something positive, something natural uh, reaction of our body, you know. Um, so to cope with heritage language anxiety at family level, as you asked, uh, we already discussed some of the strategies, but again, first thing to consider is perhaps the crucial role that language anxiety and emotions play in children's multilingual development, as well as their social skills and family relations and bounds, you know. Multilingual parents uh, 
actually should take heritage language anxiety and coping strategies into account when they plan their family language practices and policies yeah. to stop heritage language anxiety at least from being detrimental to their children's bilingual development or social interactions through avoidance, you know? So just avoid avoidance. And, um, you know, abandoning or downgrading the heritage language causes further socio-emotional problems in the long run, you know? Um, as one of my participants uh, shared, the mother, uh, they abandoned the heritage language and uh, the child now is 14 year old and he constantly tells his mom not to come to school, not to speak the heritage language around his friends. And his friends shouldn't know that uh, his mother is Turkish. So all these shames and fears, uh, they are all related to experiences also in schools and in, uh, in the family uh, back in you know, uh, home country. So there should be a collaborative effort between families, schools, and relatives to support children's uh, multilingual development and their socio-emotional development, such as self-esteem and emotional regulation skills or coping strategies for language anxiety. Fantastic. Um, so many nuggets of, uh, of wisdom. Uta, did you have a question? No, no, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I'm just looking at the clock here. We are getting to the full hour. <laughs> um, uh, do we have any more questions from the audience that we want to well, bring I, in? I was going to say um, we we do have a lot of comments in in the uh, in, in the comments section. And I'm thinking to myself, today we we've had a lot of more comments than questions and it, it really i think it's we all have this this collective head nodding during the whole session going yes yes i felt that myself and with my kids you know these are the things that i can i can you know think about and how i would i'm starting next tomorrow uh, this it's going to be something you know a new awareness that i have uh with my own kids thanks to the new awareness that I had about my own past. <laughs> and this is so powerful. Uh, it's really been a, a fantastic session, uh, uh, sort of a, a, an awakening, I, I feel. And um, yes, time is sort of running short, but maybe we can run through some of these comments very quickly. Uh, we do want to acknowledge everybody you know, watching on, the, on both our live streams on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you so much today for a very interactive session. I see a lot of comments to other uh, participants, uh, to other other uh, audience members. So this is this has been really really interactive uh, from from all angles. So where were we before we had we had Trisha's uh, question? Then we had Nina. Let me let me put this up. Nina says uh, linguistic insecurity can also occur in case there's a variant of a language that has less prestige. So example is Belgian French uh, speakers feeling insecure when comparing themselves to French speakers from France. And then there's a follow-up comment from uh, from Heather saying that's a good point, Nina. So, and uh, she'd like to hear if Tetsu has an opinion about this from Quebecois French also. And I was thinking about this during the, the, the discussion also and thinking, yeah, I mean, not only Quebecois, but also I grew up in Taiwan. So there's the Mandarin from Taiwan versus the Mandarin from mainland. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's the variant that has a, a strong negative uh, feeling versus the, the what is called the standard. I guess the you know, same can be said about the Swiss German uh, with the Hochdeutsch from Germany. Uh, I'd like to hear your your thoughts about that. My my feeling is that from the perspective of Quebecois, a lot of these Quebecois are really proud of the Quebecois heritage and uh, they do go out with the uh, with a sense of pride but uh, obviously history with, with history some of these uh, people do feel that they have they have you know in, in canada that, english canada and, 
Yeah, we have to recognize that, that 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 is a very privileged position to be in, to be able to be that proud of a minority language, because mm -hmm. unfortunately, in most cases in the world, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be in a language even. It, it also occurs in dialects, you know, mm -hmm. any speech variety, which is less prestigious than a uh, prestigious language, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, is prone to um those um hierarchies and language insecurities okay so we do have other comments again once again very quickly uh we have moina telling us that she's doing a phd on emotional emotionality and emotional communication of mothers raising multilingual children and it's such an important topic so uh and i see so much guilt, shame, anxiety, and how that is passed on from uh, mother to child. So again, recognizing uh, the, the importance of this topic and uh, she's doing some important work. Maybe you guys can connect. What else do we have? Uh, we have uh, Yulia asking, asking Malina about which university. So uh, Malina tells her that this is, this is Burbeck, okay? Perfect. And I, I also want to recognize this one, this one, uh, talking about the three three positive things uh, in the heritage language. I kept uh, I kept nodding internally really about this one. It's not really just about language, but uh, life in general, Anything, kind of yeah. doing this, yeah. this little habit of being grateful of what, about what you have in life. But uh, this is this is a very powerful technique, uh, I'm sure. And uh, it's a very actionable item. So we do. We do reach out to our audience to, to, if you're not doing this, this is something that, that is very actionable and easy to, to track. And you'll definitely see a change in your, in your life in general. Absolutely, not only in your child's mindset, you know, also in your mindset, because most of the time we are the ones who are really affecting their emotional states. Absolutely, right. yeah, yeah. So last little comment from, at, at the end from Yulia, language is a strong social marker indeed. Uh, she, she thinks that it'll, it'll be a while before it changes, but I don't know. I want to be hopeful, positive, positive about mm -hmm. this. Absolutely. I think this globalization uh, communication is definitely improving at, at lightning pace. So uh, with our work, hopefully that we're making a, a dent yeah. in, in, in this area and uh, hopefully we can, through our mission of getting experts like yourself, yeah, yeah Jim, bringing all this to the frontline soldiers who are the, uh, the the parents out there, bringing them the, uh, the, the, the cutting edge information and actionable items as we yeah. wanna do. Uh, so is it time for us to sort of wrap up? Uh, I don't know. Yejim, I do want one more question, Yejim. If, if there's one thing you would like parents to take away from this, what would it be? Okay, well, um, recognize and understand heritage language anxiety first, right? Increasing your own awareness and knowledge and well-being and coping strategies with anxiety or other negative emotions. Um, enhance your own or children's resilience, adapting positive strategies and positive uh, emotions. and. Build a neat supportive language environment by minimizing conflict, tension, and pressure regarding the heritage language or culture. You know, follow what your child needs through a caring climate in which well-being, resilience, tolerance, and respect for diversity and different languages and variations um, are viewed as a key value to overcoming challenges of language. Uh, maintenance, home language maintenance. Fantastic. And one more nugget that you said earlier was that we shouldn't look at anxiety just as a no. negative thing because it shows that we care when you are uh, anxious about something. It means you care. It's important to you. It's not like you don't care. It doesn't matter. Uh, no, it is no. important. And that's and why studies showed, actually, yeah. studies showed like. Uh, 
most of the people who were negatively affected by anxiety were the ones who really believed like anxiety was totally negative and detrimental. And some of them died of heart attacks because of that. So uh, if we just embrace it and try to cope with it through positive ones, it'll be just fine. But if it's a, if it's, if it's a very high level, you know, just see a specialist. I'm, I'm not a... Uh, specialist on that like I don't you have g- given us so much specialist knowledge uh, yes and th- this is kind of I, I think this of, of we've done many sessions this is the 22nd ep- episode we've done but I think this is the one that may be uh, raising questions in every single one of our, our listeners whether you're listening live well, so or, nice or recording mm-hmm. yeah absolutely it, it's it's ter- it's so important thank you thank you thank you Thank you. All right. Well, the, the final few comments that came in all reflect this. You know, thank you for a great <laughs> session. This has been very helpful. Thank you all so much for this. But we have to start turning the page slowly well, no. to the next session. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me put up the, the announcement for the next session. Always very important. And turn to my colleagues, please. Yes, and on the 1st of June, we're looking forward to talk about multilingualism and dyslexia with Dr. Karin Martin from the Carinthia University of Applied Science in Austria. Well, most people associate uh, dyslexia with reading difficulties, but first signs can be actually recognized already at a very early stage. So how do children uh, with dyslexia process verbal information efficiently? And what about dyslexic children uh, who grow up with multiple languages? So please join us on Tuesday, the 1st of June at 1 p.m. New York, 6 p.m. London, 7 p.m. Paris. And what time in uh, Japan? Tetsu? It's, it's 2 a.m. in Japan. 2 a.m. in Japan. Is it bright and early or really late? I don't know. It depends on your your lifestyle yes okay so i hope you all enjoyed this session i'm i'm pretty sure you did with the interactions that we've had in the comment section uh i for one definitely uh, appreciated this uh, fantastic session so thanks again Yezhen, for all your your expertise and uh, it was my really, pleasure thank you for the invite once again really i enjoyed it so much everybody and we have a little uh, feedback form uh, for those of you watching for the first time and those of you watching uh, all 22nd episodes. Please do give us feedback so that we can improve uh, and deliver uh, better and better contents as we go along. So the link is in the description. And uh, until June 1st is the next session, we bid you hello. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Hey, hey. <laughs> Hey, Dodge.